Welcome to Psychology of the Daf. We are on Gemara Shabbos, Daf Kuf Chaf Beis, Daf 122. Now, in this Gemara, they were discussing, and also in the Mishnah, a situation where a Goy does a Malacha for himself, but also for a Jew. And it makes a difference what kind of Malacha it is. Because if it's a kind of Malacha, let's say, like cooking food, where you might make a larger amount, even if the guy does it for himself, if he's aware of your presence, there is a reason to suspect that he is doing it also for you. On the other hand, the Gemara talks about, or the Mishnah, I should say, talks about a case where there's a ramp, and the ramp is put down from the boat to the land. That one ramp covers everybody. Similarly, and what rhymes with ramp is lamp, that also if a guy lights a lamp and is reading for himself, and it's not just a trick, but he's actually just lights a lamp and reads for himself, you could also read, because the Gemara, or the, uh, you know, based on the Mishnah, says the phrase, ner la'echad ner la'meya. One lamp, one lamp that is good for one person is good for a hundred people. If you're in a room and you're providing a source of light, that source of light seems to uh, be sufficient for any number of people, provided they're within the line of, of sight of the, of the light from the lamp. So this phrase, ner echad ner lamea, certainly lends itself to a certain amount of poetic license. And in studying this phrase, there's another area uh, in the Gemara where it comes up as well. The Gemara in Bava Basra on Daf uh, 144b, Kuf Mem Dalad Amad Beis, describes a situation where brothers uh, have an inheritance. Now, when, when there's an inheritance, the inheritors have a choice. They could divide up the property, so, for instance, if they get a large parcel of land, they can divide it up amongst themselves, or they can keep it all in one pool. And the advantage in keeping it all in one pool is some some properties don't lend themselves to being divided up easily, or even if it's a fund of money. Sometimes one can invest money uh, much better in a larger amount than in smaller portions. So the option is available for people who inherit to remain partners after the inheritance. And the Mishnah in Bava Basra, it discusses a particular circumstance where an individual, he uh, is part of a group. Let's say there's three brothers, Reuven, Shimon, and Levi. Reuven, Shimon, and Levi inherit uh, uh, from their father, and now they have a pool of money. And from that pool of money, they're supporting themselves. Uh, they more or less live in the same household, on the same farm, in the same estate as was done in days of old. And they're all supporting themselves roughly, more or less, plus or minus an apple or two from the same estate. So now the, uh, the case that's discussed in the Gemara is, well, consider a, a person who wants to go abroad. Let's say one out of these three brothers wants to go abroad. He wants to go abroad, the Mishnah says, to study Torah or to study a profession, to study an ominous. He wants to go abroad. Now, on the one hand, he, like the other brothers, is entitled to uh, a share of sustenance from the pool of money that they inherited. On the other hand, the brothers uh, argue, and that's what the Gemara explains, the, Gemara ar- the brothers argue, Birchas Abayas Baruba, meaning, and we'll have to translate it simply, but then we'll have to go into Tosfus, meaning that a house is blessed with a, a multitude of people. So when you have a group of people living together, there are certain economic benefits. Now, what those economic benefits are, it's a little bit difficult to to quantify precisely. Tosas will attempt to do so. But let us just say that we can recognize intuitively that it costs less for five people to live together than for five people to live separate. So the Gemara then asks, well, let him at least take one-fifth let assume it's five brothers, let him take the portion that he normally would get from the expenses. Even though it's true, living separately, his expenses are greater. To that, the Gemara says, Hachanami, yes, that's right. The Mishnah was only addressing that he shouldn't be able to take money from the pool to support his living style when he's abroad. He only can take the amount that, he's, that he is entitled to actually if he were at the estate. So, in analyzing right, what is... What is this quality of living together? What exactly does the Gemara mean when it says, Birchas Habayas Baruba, that the house is blessed with a multitude of people? So, Rabbeinu Hanano says, 
Ner le'echad, ner lemea. One lamp is the same lamp as for a hundred. So that's answer number one. Sounds pretty straightforward. Answer number two that Tosus gives, explanation number two that Tosus gives, is yesh meforshim de mazlo de bey tre odif. Some explain that the mazel, which we'll have to translate in a moment, the mazel of two is better than the mazel of one. So first of all, before we translate mazel exactly, uh, what really is the difference between the first terrace and the second terrace? Both seem to be saying something about an economy of scale. Both seem to be saying that that a larger group of people seem to be able to support themselves financially and otherwise more than than individuals that are separate. So we have to kind of understand here if Tosis gives two explanations, Tosis does not waste words, their analytical abilities were keen. What in the world is the difference between these two answers? So let us try to translate the word mazel and then maybe it'll help us a little bit. Now strictly speaking, literally mazel means the zodiac. That means that there there was a strongly held belief, uh, apparently by many Amaroim, if not all Amaroim, uh, certainly most of the Rishonim, that there is some quality to the way in which a person is born, under which star, under which moment during the day, the hour. There's the, the Gemara and Brachus, and the, uh, you know, that talks about the mazels and the dreams and the Gemara and Shabbos that uh, we're still yet going to get to, that's going to discuss mazel and, uh, and how a person is fated to be. But we really don't have to get too fancy. Um, what we can understand about Mazel is, regardless of whether one believes exactly in the zodiac or in the horoscope, what we can understand is that there is a basic acceptance that the circumstances, the fate, the material fate under which a person was born um, is a quality of their of their life, meaning... Um, whether you're born into a wealthy family or not, whether you're born into a good climate in an area where there's a good climate or not, whether you're born during a time of a robust economy or not so robust economy, what types of natural talents and deficits do you have? Loosely speaking, that's considered your mazel. Now, it's important to understand that regardless of exactly what's the cause of mazel, whether it comes from the zodiac or it's just the way a person is born, or it's this thing we call nature, whatever you want to call it exactly, it represents less a matter of the person's merit and more a matter of what their actual natural endowments or lack thereof are. In other words, their actual fate. Uh, if you want it today, you could call it, you know, their DNA also. Whatever it is, it's who they are right now without any merit. And the proof to that is because we have a saying, Ein Mazel be Yisrael. We just recently saw an expression of that in last week's parsha with Bilam. Jews, uh, depending on how you learn Pshat, but in some way are not subject merely to fate. They're not just subject to the natural happenstance and circumstances of their life. They also, because they have merit, because they have schus, they're also able to um, have their fate changed. So Pashtus, however you want to understand the mechanism metaphysically, Pashtus, the actual outcome, the actual meaning of the word mazel means the sum total of your personal circumstances, your strengths, your weaknesses, your assets, the quality of family, the quality of community, everything that you were born into, things in short that you did not really earn. And it's clear to me that the second shot in Tosus is referring to that because Tosus could have said dizchusa de betre adif. Tosus could have said the merit of two people is greater than one, which we know is true, right? Zchus de rabim adif. We know that a tzibor is uh, more eligible and their prayers are more answered and more likely to succeed in certain spiritual efforts than an, than an individual alone. But that's not what they say. They don't say zchusa de betre adif. And that's probably because when it comes to finances, we don't take into account um, unknown and unmeasurables such as chus, because we don't know what a person's chus is, and the person himself doesn't really know. So perhaps it's just not a factor in terms of evaluating economical 
issues. So then what does it mean? So we have to understand the difference between Ner la Echad, Ner la Mea, which was the first explanation in Tosfus, and the second explanation, the Mazel de Beitre Adif. And what I believe is that Ner la Echad, Ner la Mea is simply an economical point. It's simply a matter of resources. We know factually that it uses approximately the same amount of energy to heat a home when one person lives there or many people live in there. If you want to heat all the rooms, and especially in the ancient times, they didn't have too many rooms. So the same fire that's going to heat up a, a home with one person is going to heat up a home with five people. So there's economies of scale. We know the same lamp that can light up a room for one person can, can light up a room for many people. So this is an economic point. However, Mazda Beitre Odev is not talking about economics per se, although there, there's an economic nafkamina because the, uh, the use this as a reason why the brother who goes abroad cannot take for his living expenses except for what it would normally have cost for him, for him having lived with his brothers. So what is this idea? I think what it means is, is that there's this, there's this idea of complementarity in most family systems whether it's between a husband and wife or two parents and children, that each person brings to the table different uh, deficits and different assets. And that in a wise family, the different assets and the different deficits are not at war with each other, but they work in a complementary fashion in order to support each other. Say you have a household, and say you have one person who's very talented in terms of... Um, uh, in terms of being handy and fixing and craftsmanship. And then you have another person in the household who's very good with agriculture. That person has a green thumb. And say you have another person in the household who's very good in business. If these three people were to take an approach that we're all equal and we all have to share the chores equally, that would be foolish because each one has a skill and each one has a deficit. The one with the green thumb is not necessarily handy in repairs. The one with repairs is not necessarily a good businessman. The one who's a businessman is not necessarily good with the farming. So if this household of people, instead of looking at each other's um, deficits and trying to make everything perfectly fair, if this group of people were able to, to recognize the relative strengths and weaknesses among them and work together, then you have actually something that's much more powerful and much stronger than the unit alone. And that's really the idea of Mazel de Beitre Adif, that the fate, because we're not talking about schus here, we're not talking about merit, and we're not talking about strictly economical points like that it uses the same lamp to light up a room for one person as for five people. We're talking about here of a combination of skills and deficits that if everybody respects and works together, they're actually able to extract much more productivity. And when we think of this psychologically between uh, couples or between family members, it comes to mind the idea that oftentimes the weaknesses that we see in others are also strengths. And oftentimes the things that we believe to be strengths can also be weaknesses. And when we meet somebody and we choose to marry somebody, oftentimes we either don't notice their deficits or we find those deficits to be endearing or charming only later over time to find them irritating and even to loathe and despise those deficits. But the truth is that who we marry and who we're going to have a family with and our family is Bashert. And it would be most inopportune not to recognize that you are thrust into a relationship with different people in order to learn from their differentness, in order to not just point fingers at everybody's deficit, but instead to ask what type of asset does this person bring to the family system and to ask what type of lessons am I supposed to learn because this is my lot, this is Bashert that I'm supposed to be with these people, with a particular spouse and have particular children. And what does each one have to teach me? Because that's the real, that's the real power. Then you get Maslow de Beitre Adif. Then you get this situation where the sum total of the different abilities and disabilities that each person brings to the table, that sum total is something that's going to be a benefit to you and to everybody else if it's respected. So when you encounter 
within your spouse things that you quote you know don't like or find annoying or think to be inferior maybe it would be helpful it'd be helpful for all of us if we stopped and thought about these things that that irritate us what are we supposed to learn and let's not go for the for the long suffering the serious nefesh tzaddik argument oh i'm supposed to learn how to live and suffer with this person baloney that's not what you're supposed to learn god doesn't want you to suffer you're supposed to learn how to live and be happy with such a person. You, there, there are things that you don't get. There are things you don't understand about the world. There are things that I don't understand about the world. If I'm going to be irritated with somebody else, it's not just, it's getting off easy. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a cheap way out. It's a cop out for me to say, oh, my uh, thing is it's an isayon. I'm supposed to learn how to live in Nebuch with this person. Please spare yourself the pity party. That's not the issue. What you're supposed to do, what anybody's supposed to do, when you encounter somebody who's different than you and frustrating who you're close with, is you're not just supposed to pass some kind of nisayan. That's silly. You're supposed to actually and truly get that this person is somebody different. And 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 Ezeo Chacham Alome may call Adam who is a wise person, someone who learns from everybody. There's something you're supposed to learn. There's something you're supposed to get when a when a man and woman get together and they're very different. If they keep being open and not frustrated with each other and they keep learning from each other, the sharp edges get rounded. The edges that are too round and too smooth get sharp. There is a value to really seeing each other's differentness and even weaknesses as strengths. There's a tremendous value. And then you're in a position... If you have a relationship like that, you're in a position to be parents because parenting will certainly challenge you in this way that w one child or many children will have qualities or features that don't necessarily fit either the mold of your family or even the mold of the school or the mold of the community. And you can sit there and, and be angry and be frustrated and get all scoldy, or you could look at what is the quality that this person has that needs to shine and look at it. What is the lesson? What does everybody else need to learn from this person's abilities or disabilities? And if we do that in our adventures in life, we're going to be much more successful.